My goals are to give a quick overview of neurotransmitters and then, using that as our foundation, to talk about the most commonly used drugs, both prescription and recreational. This presentation will feature lots and lots of mnemonics, which is designed to boost both short-term recall and long-term retention. Key concepts will be repeated multiple times. In addition, anything that is particularly high yield for boards and wards will be highlighted with this icon, so pay extra attention when it's on screen. Finally, it helps to know why you are sitting through this material, especially if you're not planning on going into psychiatry. There are a few reasons. First, the vast majority of psychoactive drugs are being prescribed not by psychiatrists, but by doctors in other fields, with primary care forming the bulk of that. Therefore, it's important for all doctors to have a solid foundation in the subject to be able to prescribe responsibly. Second, substance abuse has been and continues to be a major factor in society, and there is no field outside of pathology where you will not encounter patients using psychoactive substances. Finally, you can and will save lives through responsible use of these drugs, as well as by knowing when to refer to a high level of care. This graph illustrates that while the number of overdoses from illicit drugs has remained relatively constant, drug overdoses from prescriptions have skyrocketed in the past decade. This is iatrogenic, at least in part, and brings us back to the concept of responsible use. A quick warning before we proceed. To fully understand this presentation, you'll need to have studied the following topics. Basic neurology, like action potentials, synapses, and the autonomic nervous system, as well as basic pharmacology concepts like agonist, antagonist, half-life, and so on. Let's begin our discussion of neurotransmitters. First, we'll cover some basic principles behind neurotransmitters. Then we'll discuss each of the major neurotransmitters one by one. In order to simplify the principles of neurotransmitters in psychopharmacology, I've come up with what are called the three rules of neurotransmission. These help us to tie together a lot of what you'll be learning. The first rule of neurotransmission is this. What goes up must come down. Basically, this rule deals with the concepts of intoxication and withdrawal. Each drug has its own particular effects, which we will study in some detail. But when somebody is withdrawing from that drug, the opposite effects will often be observed. This is because the brain strives for homeostasis and will act to counterbalance any observed excesses. I'll be using a graph like this during the presentation to illustrate this concept. This graph indicates a stimulant such as cocaine or amphetamines. This graph, on the other hand, shows a depressant such as a benzodiazepine. We'll return to this concept more later. The second rule of neurotransmission is, a neurotransmitter is not easily fooled. Anytime you give a drug to increase the amount of a neurotransmitter, the synapse will remove receptors for that neurotransmitter, effectively making itself less sensitive to that drug. This process is known as downregulation. Conversely, if you try to decrease the amount of a neurotransmitter present, the synapse will try to make itself more sensitive by recruiting more receptors to the cell surface, known as upregulation. These processes account for much of what is observed during drug tolerance and withdrawal. There are additional mechanisms involving G proteins and DNA regulation, but those are beyond the scope of this lecture for now. The third and final rule of neurotransmission is, with great power comes great responsibility. What I mean by this is that the efficacy of a treatment is often intrinsically linked to how powerful of an agent it is. Unfortunately, the most powerful drugs tend to have the most severe and dangerous side effects. Because of this, we can't always use the big guns right off the bat. It's best to always attempt to treat with the least powerful option that will still produce good results. The presentation will use this key for neurotransmitters. We'll go over each of these in turn. In addition, a drug's effects on each neurotransmitter will be noted, with a plus sign for agonists, a double-headed arrow for partial agonists, a minus sign for antagonists, and an unequal sign for inverse agonists. As a quick review, a full agonist mimics the effect of a neurotransmitter, a partial agonist mimics it but only to a certain lower point, an antagonist blocks the effect of a neurotransmitter, and finally an inverse agonist produces an opposite effect to the neurotransmitter. Let's begin our discussion of each individual neurotransmitter with dopamine. When you think dopamine, you should be familiar with each of its many functions. Luckily, each function can be packed away into each letter of the word itself. Let's see how. D stands for drive. Dopamine governs motivation and reward. Anytime you think about doing an action to get some kind of a reward, whether that's making food so you can eat it or studying for a test so that you can do well, dopamine is involved. O is for psychosis. Specifically, drugs that block dopamine seem to mitigate some features of psychosis, such as delusions and hallucinations. P is for Parkinsonism. 
as a decreased ability to secrete dopamine in parts of the brain is at the core of Parkinson's disease pathology. A is for attention, as drugs that boost dopamine can be used to improve attention and concentration. M is for motor. Dopamine is strongly linked to the body's motor function, and imbalances in dopamine account for conditions such as Parkinson's where motor function is significantly altered. I is for inhibition of prolactin. Dopamine, in fact, was once known as prolactin inhibiting factor, which explains its crucial importance in regulating prolactin release. Therefore, when dopamine is blocked, a side effect can be milk release from the breasts. N is for narcotics, showing that the release of dopamine plays a strong role in how addictive a substance is. Finally, E is for extrapyramidal, most often heard in the context of extrapyramidal side effects. This relates back to the fact that dopamine controls motor functions, so if you block that, then you can get significant motor side effects. We'll go over the extrapyramidal side effects in more detail later. A high yield fact about dopamine is that it is involved in the reward pathway. This reward pathway is located in the ventral tegmental area, shown here. You can remember the VTA by thinking of the phrase, very tired addict, to remind you that this pathway is overexerted in addicts. Within this pathway, the most important area is the nucleus accumbens. The next neurotransmitter we will talk about is serotonin. Serotonin is a complex molecule because it has so many roles in your body. The way that helps me to remember them is to think of the rhyme, head, red, and fed. These three words encapsulate most of serotonin's functions. First, head reminds you that serotonin is an abundant neurotransmitter in the brain and is linked to, among other things, depression, anxiety, social interaction, impulsivity, sex drive, and migraines through various mechanisms. Next, red should remind you of blood, specifically that serotonin affects platelet blinding and adhesion, so interfering with platelet function can cause problems with bleeding. Finally comes fed. The role of serotonin in the gut is often underestimated. After all, 90% of all serotonin in the body is in your GI tract. Specifically, serotonin seems to drive both GI motility as well as nausea, which explains why a drug like Zofran, which blocks serotonin, is so effective at preventing nausea. One way to remember serotonin is to look at what happens when your body has too much of it. There is a disorder known as serotonin syndrome, which often occurs when two serotonergic drugs are taken at the same time. As opposed to the head, fed, and red of normal serotonin, this can be remembered as head, red, and dead. Head refers to the confusion and agitation that often accompanies serotonin syndrome. Red is for the color of the patient's flushed, warm skin, and dead is to remind you that this is no joke. There is a significant mortality rate associated with this syndrome. In fact, the death of a college student from serotonin syndrome in 1984, after she was prescribed two serotonergic drugs by an overworked intern, is what led directly to the federal regulations imposing the 80-hour workweek restrictions for interns. One bit of trivia that frequently gets tested is the fact that serotonin comes from the raphe nuclei in the brain. Why is this so important? Beats me, but it shows up on tests. So here's a handy mnemonic to help you memorize that. To connect serotonin to the Raphae nuclei, think of this painting illustrating Ser Raphael. A quick note on serotonin. Serotonin is also known as 5-hydroxytryptamine, often abbreviated as 5-HT. So don't be confused if you see references to 5-HT. Just substitute the word serotonin, you'll be good to go. Norepinephrine, our next neurotransmitter, is a key component of the sympathetic nervous system and its associated fight-or-flight response. For example, if you see a scary creature such as a Cerberus, your body is likely to release lots of norepinephrine into the brain, while releasing its counterpart epinephrine peripherally into the bloodstream. If you think about how your body would react if it were to run into a Cerberus, you can guess a lot of norepinephrine's functions. First, your brain would snap to the current moment, concentrating and focusing on what is at hand. You would get a burst of energy to carry you through your soon-to-start sprint. Peripherally, your body would prepare to fight or fly by increasing your heart rate, raising your blood pressure to shunt blood to the most important parts of the body, releasing glucose for energy, and putting less essential services like pooping and peeing on hold. Let's use our friend Cerberus to help us remember one more fact about norepinephrine. Like serotonin and the raphe nucleus, the fact that norepinephrine is produced in the locus ceruleus is frequently tested. Cerberus ceruleus. Cerberus ceruleus. If you can remember that connection, you'll be prepared to answer the inevitable test questions on this. The next two neurotransmitters we will go over are, essentially, the brain's on and off switches. Glutamate is the main on switch, whereas GABA is the main off switch. Everything else is mere modulation. Let's go over GABA first. When you hear GABA, I want you to think inhibitory. 
Now that's a bit of a stretch to make, but first let's watch this video. 30, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, the Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, a tariff bill, the Holly Smoot. What do boring lectures tend to have in common? They just drone on and on, just gabbing and gabbing away. What could be more boring and sleep-inducing than a lecturer who just keeps gabbing? GABA is inhibitory, like a boring lecturer who just keeps gabbing on. Now that this boring lecture has put you to sleep, think about what your body is going through. It relaxes, both physically and mentally. You feel more at ease, and perhaps a small feeling of euphoria overtakes you. Your muscles unclench, and your breathing slows. Any trace of anxiety is out of your mind, and you look like the exact opposite of someone having a seizure. This is important to remember, as drugs that enhance GABA are often used to break a seizure. When you hear glutamate, I want you to think excitatory. In this way, it is the exact opposite of GABA. How to remember this? Well, there's not a lot of things more exciting than mating for most of the animal kingdom. Let's leave it at that. Glutamate equals excitatory. When most people hear histamine, they think of allergies, not neurotransmitters. However, once you first see the effect of putting a hyper dog to sleep using an antihistamine, you'll never forget that histamine is also a neurotransmitter. The upper brain, the cortex, depends upon a constant stream of histamine for activation, so once you cut off that supply, the cortex shuts down. We can remember the functions of histamine by thinking histamine. H for hay fever, I for itching, and Z for sleeping. Conversely, when we give something that blocks histamine, we'll see itching and hives disappear, hay fever put at bay, and the patient will get some sleep. Something to note, first-generation antihistamines such as diphenhydramine or Benadryl work both peripherally and in the central nervous system, so they're used for sedation. Newer antihistamines, such as loratadine or claritin, however, only work peripherally, which is why they're advertised as non-drowsy. Acetylcholine, or ACH, is in a lot of ways the opposite of norepinephrine. Whereas norepi governs the sympathetic nervous system, ACH is largely responsible for regulating the parasympathetic nervous system. We can remember acetylcholine's functions by embedding them into the letters A, C, H. First, A is for autonomic. The parasympathetics regulate rest and digest functions by slowing the heart rate, focusing on digestion, and promoting sexual arousal. C is for contraction, reminding you that ACH is the neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction. So drugs that affect ACH peripherally are used against neuromuscular diseases like myasthenia gravis. Finally, H is for hippocampus, which you will recall is involved in memory. This is particularly important in geriatric psychiatry when dealing with dementia, as many drugs that boost ACH can help to combat the memory loss seen in Alzheimer's dementia. ACH, Autonomic Contraction Hippocampus. The last neurotransmitter we'll focus on is actually a group of compounds that bind to the opioid receptors in the brain. There are many naturally occurring opioids, all of which help to regulate pain perception. A runner's high is a well-known example of your body releasing endogenous opioids, known as endorphins or encephalins, in response to stress. However, there are many drugs which bind to the opioid receptor much more strongly and function both as painkillers and narcotics. The human race enjoys opioids so much that entire wars have been waged over access to it. One example is the opium wars which took place in China in the 1800s. While opium wasn't the only factor in the war, it can help us to remember the functions of opioids. Let's focus on this one guy in the picture, an armed Chinese man. This armed Chinese man can help us remember the functions of opioids. First, A is for analgesia, or pain relief, the most well-known function of opioids. R is for respiratory depression, or the slowing of breathing rate observed in higher doses of opioids. In fact, opioids make the respiratory center in the brain insensitive to carbon dioxide, so death in opioid overdoses via Ondine's curse, or simply forgetting to breathe. M is for meiosis, or constriction of the pupils. This is a classic finding in opioid overdose. Pinpoint pupils in an abtunded patient. E is for euphoria, or the feeling of bliss and well-being that opioids give. D is for drowsiness, or the slowing of mental functioning that occurs with opioid use. Finally, C stands for constipation, which helps us remember that opioids cause constipation as a frequent side effect, so people receiving chronic pain management oftentimes require stool softeners. And that's it for the neurotransmitters. There are actually many more neurotransmitters than this, but we don't understand the functions of most of these at this point, so we'll stick to the eight most clinically significant ones discussed here. 
Because they are so foundational to the study of psychopharmacology, let's take a moment to review each of the neurotransmitters we've discussed and try to embed them into our mind one more time. For dopamine, we just have to remember the word itself. D for drive, O for psychosis, P for Parkinsonism, A for attention, M for motor, I for inhibition of prolactin, N for narcotics, and E for extrapyramidal. Serotonin, remember head, red, and fed. Head for its effects on depression, anxiety, and migraines, red for the interaction with platelets, and fed for GI tract motility and control of nausea. For NE, let's not forget our friend the Cerberus. The Cerberus reminds us of the fight or flight functions of the sympathetic nervous system, as well as the locus cerulius, where norepinephrine comes from. When you think GABA, think what? Inhibitory, like that boring lecturer who just keeps GABA, GABA, gaba on. When you think glutamate, think what? Excitatory, like mating is for most of the animal kingdom. His demeanor is rememberable by the first three letters. H for hay fever, I for itching, and Z for sleeping. You can remember acetylcholine by its abbreviation ACH, A for autonomics, C for contraction, and H for hippocampus, which, if your own hippocampus is working right now, should remind you of memory. And finally, opioids should bring to mind the opium wars, and specifically the armed Chinese man. A for analgesia, R for respiratory depression, M for meiosis or pinpoint pupils, E for euphoria, D for drowsiness, and the C from Chinese for constipation. All done. I'd recommend taking a break about now, as research has shown that it's impossible to learn for more than about 25 minutes per hour anyway. Go outside, take a nap, grab a snack, and come back when you're feeling refreshed.